So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay and to an old friend because this is of course Minas Tirith, a map which often produces abs absolutely monstrous sieges in terms of length. This time it's actually not so long by Minas Tirith standards anyway, like 50,000 frames is obviously still longer than the vast majority of sieges that I even show. Um, but for Minas Tirith, I've often seen it push into the 60k, brushing against the 70k range. So, I mean, that is obviously um, very, very long. But on this occasion, slightly less, um, but still longer than most sieges we will see. And that comes down mainly to the layout, obviously, of Minas Tirith, a classic wedding cake style settlement where you have several layers. And obviously, the defenders can then really bog the attackers down if they so choose. Um, however, most of the decisive action will actually take place on the first layer more often than not because it's where the attacks have got a little bit more room. The defenders do have to defend it most of the time um, and that's where some gaps can be found that the attackers can take advantage of. Uh, but it is a themed battle as well, good versus evil. So um, I know that it didn't happen at sunset in the movies but it is uh, somewhat nice actually, a sunset siege from Minas Tirith, dusk over the southern kingdom. But let's go through the attacking armies. First and foremost, as soon as the motorbike just outside stops revving. Uh, but we have Ranch B Dressing, who's going to be playing as Mordor. That's a name that I haven't heard of, so perhaps a newer player. Moran on Archers, always useful to have just some basic archers when you're on the attack in a settlement like this, as I often say. Orc Archers as well. Orc Archers are actually probably slightly better for it, just because they are cheaper. And really, you're not going to be doing a huge amount of damage with your archers, they're just there to be slightly annoying. Um, so I do actually prefer the cheaper option in this case, because Mordor have got plenty of places where they can spend a little bit of extra money. Um, around on guard, basic spears, an interesting choice, not necessarily the worst choice though, because something that does often happen in Minas Tirith, because of how far apart the attackers often initially um, deploy in, cavalry sally outs can be very effective on Minas Tirith, so having a few units of spears like this just to make sure that's a little bit more difficult can actually be very useful. Um, orc fodder can also fill that role, albeit to a slightly lesser extent, because obviously they are orc fodder, generally speaking, their only real purpose is to get in the way of any kind of damage and cavalry charges will still dominate them. Orc Maulers, with the armour upgrade, going to be useful against the defenders because it is three Numenorean style factions that are on the defence today, all of which um, are very heftily reliant on their armour to absorb quite a bit of damage, so basic axemen like this can be very, very efficient. But of course, all Numenorean factions generally have decent ranged options as well, which of course the Orc Maulers are very bad against, so a bit of a catch-22 there. Moran on infantry, they were always going to show up because they're reasonably cheap, reasonably numerous, they're not going to be able to outclass other line infantry from Numenorean factions, but if you have them in support of something a little bit stronger, that can be a winning combination often for Mordor, and it's often how they go about doing longer engagements, if that's what they want to do. Moran on infantry back there. If they want to do shorter engagements, however, these very shadowy gentlemen, the Black Guard of barad is often how they will do that by trying to force their way through choke points. They can't afford to do that too early in a battle, um, because in Minas Tirith especially, choke points are relatively easy to bulk up on, um, and the mass push may very well fail in that, in that regard. And these great shield infantry units are not actually that impressive in sustained melee, no better than really, really basic line infantry, um, so you do have to be careful. But of course, the great shield, it doesn't often give them, it doesn't only give them um, a big amount of mass, but it also means that they're very resilient to arrows as well, which can be useful in its own way when you're attacking in a siege. And he's also got some Olag High, some troll drummers and some Uruk captains back here. So the Olag High obviously really, really good as a bludgeon. The troll drummers will be really useful for keeping all of his basic units in line. Um, and then his Uruk captains, a unit of armor piercing, bodyguard line infantry, uh, which can be uh, very nice at the center of a uh, numbers heavy army. Um, it doesn't seem like it would be all that he would have brought. Um, maybe he's got some Nazgul hidden in there somewhere that we just can't see, or maybe some Adunaim shadow bows, but not much more. Um, so he hasn't gone for like the full quality armies that Mordor can do, which I think is actually a good thing. Blessing in disguise, actually, I think, for the attackers, because in this situation you do need some armies to go numbers heavy. We have YZUK86, a name that I do know very well, and he's going to be playing as Angmar, so he's got some Snaga, he's got some upgraded Witcher on Piper on the flank, so he knows immediately, because he's obviously played this map before, being uh, a hardy veteran of the game. He knows that some cavalry could be coming his way on a map like Minas Tirith, so he's got some pikemen already um, guarding one of his flanks. He's got some Snaga pushing up the siege tower, as well as some Angmar marauders, which are obviously the very basic entry-level line infantry for Angmar. More Snaga stalkers as well. The hardier line infantry, however, are the upgraded guardians of Khan Doom, 
Their most impressive asset is their defensive abilities, big shield value, armor, very, very tough to break down. Not necessarily the best at dealing damage, which is what holds them back from reaching the heady heights of something like the Alcarondas Legion or Numenorean Cohort. But they're not far off that in terms of efficiency, and that it is a very good unit for you to base an assault around because of how tough they are to just finish off. There are witches here, as well as in the middle of these Blackwatch legions, so you know Y2K will be hoping that if they do bulk up on one of those hills towards the top end of Minas Tirith, the witches can break them down, because you don't really want to be grinding into the defenders in that sort of situation, and it does give them a viable option for getting rid of them. Catapult. Again, just for peeling away some of the walls. Witch Arm Scourge Raiders for throwing those axes. Again, could be very, very useful. Some Angmar Halberds as well. And some more Witch Arm Pikemen. So yeah, he's got his uh, he's got his defense ready. And he's got some Trolls of Gundabad in the back as well to be a little bit more mobile in case the cavalry tries to go back to the red line. Over here, we have another Mordorine played by Windy Pops. Good to see him. And he is going to be having some morale on guard at the front. So once again, he's got some units just in front, making sure that any cavalry that comes out has a slightly harder time. As soon as the attackers start to group their armies together, it becomes a little bit more tricky for the um, for the cavalry to find gaps because they can all pool their resources of anti-cavalry infantry to deal with them. Morale on infantry in big numbers as well with the siege towers again, classic. They will need some assistance if they're to make any real ground on enemies, but to push the towers up first is, is fine. Orc Maul is pushing up the ram, that's, actually you know, the ram is, is that the wrong way around? Or is that the right way? I'm not sure. Either way, it's an interesting unit to have on the ram, to be honest with you, because they'll get shredded by arrows, even with the armor upgrade on the approach. We'll see if that does turn out to be the case. Sauron's Will, I like this pick, because they are maybe a little bit riskier, being an Orc higher-end shock infantry unit. Questionable efficiency in many cases, but against the Numenorean factions, I don't think that's going to be too much of an issue, because the AP is going to be universally useful or at captains as well with the AP. Orc Maulers in big numbers, so yeah, he's clearly going, trying to really lean into Mordor's armor-piercing options with Moran on Halberds. Trolls as well with their big attacks. Troll Drummers at the back, we've got some more Javelins, which are also going to be useful for the same reasons. And also a unit of Blackguard of Baradur at the back as well for pushing through. So yeah, definitely a very heavy armor-piercing core, which considering the opponents, very, very useful. We have T-Bagger who did pretty well actually in the Ruin of Osgiliath Siege where he was on the defence as the good factions. He was probably the player on the defence that did the best job. We'll see how well he does on the attack. He seems to have gone for a much more quality focused army than his allies, which is interesting. He has gone for the Melkor's Chosen, which I actually agree with bringing one of these units because it makes sallying out the cavalry much more dangerous because there's really nothing that the Numenorians could bring that delivers quite the same level of anti-cavalry devastation as the Melkor's Chosen. Even the Haven Knights aren't really capable of the same level of damage against other cavalry than the Melkor's Chosen are. They're a little bit tankier with their armour and their shields to other things like range damage. When it comes to just beasting it out in melee, really only the champions of the White Hand hold the candle to the Melkor's Chosen in that respect. The mighty Caragor Riders. He's got some Rannon Halberds as well. Temple Execution is the first time we've seen them on the field. They don't have the armour upgrade, but still heavy swordsmen. They don't have the armour piercing but still very very strong he does have the Nazgul as well as the Temple Guard Blackguard of Baradur, Uruk Captain, Sauron's Will and Olag Kaiser pretty much all of the really high end Mordor stuff except maybe for the Rangers but they could be hidden of course are on display today so it's it's a risky army in some ways because they could they would be obviously choice number one to try and focus down with the cavalry sally out or with Rangers or something like that but it does help to offset the fact that Windy and uh, the other lad on the other side who I can't quite remember the name of um, have gone for slightly more numerous armies. He's also got some Sauron's Will and some Halberds over here with uh, with a Ram. And then the final attacking army we have is Harad, played by Valkarion. Harad, of course, again, evil men faction, but very orc-like in their mentality with numbers. Serpent Guard, I'm not sure about this pick, to be honest with you. I can understand the Melkor's chosen, because they can defend. Serpent Guard, however, are Lance Cavalry units, which are not going to be so good if really heavy Numenorean riders come for them. You can still use them to block because of how quick they are, but even if you get them into the settlement, Minas Tirith is one of those where you're not really going to get a huge amount of value. Like in more open settlements, Lance Cavalry like this can be really useful when you start to make gaps in the defense. Not so much on Minas Tirith, I have to say though, so I'm not sure about that. But Trollmen are always going to be useful because of their AP and how useful, how strong they are in melee. Ruhad Berserkers, again, cheap axemen, and much the same thing as the Orc Maulers, really. Dismounted Serpent Guard will actually do pretty well in melee, even against some of the bulkier Numenorean infantry. Um, they will still lose against some of the higher tier stuff, especially without the armor upgrade, but against a lot of the basic stuff, they should be able to overpower it, actually. Lots of Southron, Southron Pikemen, Demons of the Desert, Southron Archers, 
um, and then also some Muhad Beast Hunters back here as well. Bit of an interesting army, more of a supporting army, I would say, this from Harad. Um, but they can get away with that because they've got the furthest to travel. Now then, for the defenders, we have Katunka the Easterling, who's going to be playing as Numenor. So it's Numenor, Gondor, and Dol Amroth on the attack, all of which will go through a little bit quickly because they're all going to be mixed together. But also, in terms of infantry power, that is scary to go up against because they all have something they bring to the table. Even Dol Amroth, their heavy swordsmen, are something the other factions don't really have in the same numbers as they do. Numenor, of course, with their sort of high damage infantry, their bladed infantry, as it were, and Gondor with their spear infantry. It all really does... Um, really does add up. Numenorean Cohort, really, really strong line infantry, of course. Adunaim Shadow Bow is really good. Actually, as far as rangers go, fantastic in a skirmish fight. Um, but obviously, mainly you want them dealing that damage. Marks from the Care Andros are here. We have some fully upgraded Gondor Spearmen from Beastie 70. Uh, here we have some Numenorean Steel Bows, Armor Piercing Archers. We have to use their ammo, their limited ammo, more wisely. Seafarers, Athelian Rangers. Of some guards for Skillius. Mithrandir's rescue, so there is a little bit of cavalry that could potentially sally out. We have got some guards for Skillia, some more Numenorean cohorts are there. The Mighty Fountain Guard, obviously fantastic unit that. Belagaya Pikes and Numenorean Shield Guard around the statue. Belagaya Pikes, fully upgraded Gondor Spearmen, Wardens, Seafarers, Pelagia Marines, Nif Nim Lothian Honor Guard, Honor Infantry, Seafarers, so still the Gondorian and the Numenorean players, the Raven Helms, the Care Andros. I think as we get in over here, we'll see Dole Amroth and Levi Will, Starkiller X. He's got some Tirithair Marksmen, Dismounted Knights, the Silver Swan, Black Swan Renegades, obviously really good AP infantry. A little bit expensive for what they offer, but still on this occasion, I think they'll be just fine as long as they're backed up properly. Fountain Guard, fully upgraded Gondol Spears, Parathil Champions, Fear Causing, of course, really, really effective against massed orcs that aren't being supported properly. Ethelon's men at arms with the armor upgrades as well. Veterans of Osgiliath, Gondor infantry, Tarnostian spears, two of their marksmen. Veterans of Osgiliath are actually locked morale as well, which is a really nice thing. Haven guard, Ethelon men at arms as well with all the upgrades. Two units of Haven guard actually, so he's double dipped. But if you're going to double dip on a unit, I suppose you'd want it to be the Haven guard, Gondor infantry, and that's pretty much that. So I will actually make a little bit of a cut here because I'm not sure the defenders are actually going to sally out here because they do have one unit of cavalry. They might do, and if they do, this will be a shortcut indeed, but if they don't, it'll just be a case of uh, slowly waiting for the attackers to group up and start sieging the walls. So I'll make a cut, and we'll rejoin when the battle begins. Some wards of Minas Athil up there on the wall as well. So it would appear that this is where Beastie 70 is going to unleash his Mithrandir's retinue. I'm a little bit surprised actually to not see a couple of units of Dol Amroth Lancers as well. But it could be that going a lot more defensive on this map may pay dividends, although we saw last time, quite a while ago now, that the last Minas Tirith battle came out, a large cavalry sally out was actually very effective. He's going to be going after Ranchby Dressing, which is the name of the player I shamefully forgot in the in the um, composition phases. Yeah, Mithrandir's retinue, very tough actually. I mean, they're going to be able to absorb a lot of arrow fire, which does make them a pretty good choice for something like this. However, yeah, the Melkor's Chosen are on the way out now, and considering it's only one cavalry unit, the Melkor's Chosen can freely basically hunt them down. I think the Serpent Guard are quicker than them as well, so to be honest with you, the Serpent Guard can catch up to them, the Melkor's Chosen can do the damage. He's going to be going after Ranchby Dressing. What is he going to be doing? Unfortunately as well, like this is part of like Medieval 2's path, like, they're charging in, they charge into the Siege Tower though, but still, he did land a charge, he's going to be able to do some damage to them around on it, but he does want to get out of there quickly though, Medieval 2's pathfinding there hasn't done him any favours, because he's caught now in the Orc Fodder. And as weak as the Orc Fodder are, you can see very quickly now, as the Mithrandir's retinue continue to be caught in and amongst them, those spears will start to have their impact. And unfortunately, their Beastie 70, a disastrous cavalry charge, really. And that's one of the things that you have to be really careful when you're charging into the centre of an army that has these siege engines, because the pathing of Medieval 2 can do a lot of damage to you. And unfortunately, Beastie 70 has fallen foul of that here. What could have been a really, really effective unit of cavalry for harassing the enemy and making their advance more difficult has proven to be pretty much, at this point, a total waste of money. I mean, he's got 10 of them remaining, but they're not going to be up to the same level as a full unit of them would be, and that oftentimes they're so difficult to wear down because arrow fire is one of the main ways that uh, attackers will try and do that to force them into being committed, but on this occasion, not going to be the case. Getting caught in those spears, like, it just goes to show that spears of any tier you cannot just have your cavalry in there and expect it to do do the business. And now they were stood still for just a little bit too long. Maybe he just didn't realise they'd returned from routing. And now they're going to get ripped apart by Y2K86's uh, trolls of Gundabad. 
with those nasty spiked clubs. Of course, this does mean that the Melkor's Chosen will probably not be used for their intended purpose. There's still the Serpent Guard sort of hovering around in front of the um, in front of the area there. There's also some arrows coming in, which again, I'm not entirely convinced that's the best idea. Some two of their marksmen are starting to fire. I'm starting to fire on the units of Ranchby dressing that are starting to move forward. What are they going after? Orc archers? Uh, again, I'm not sure. Like These Orc archers, unless they, until they get into a position... There goes one of the wall sections, but until they get into a position, for me, where they're able to attack you with some reliability, there's no real need to go after them in that way. Like, make the attackers, make it force you to shoot them, basically. Otherwise, you're not really getting a huge amount of value. Like, going after these units back here is more worth your time. Because, yes, it's only morale on infantry, but you can start to cleave into their melee manpower a little bit. Get rid of some of those numbers. And the morale on infantry, at this angle, I don't know if their shields are coming into effect. But their armour is there, but it's not brilliant. Against higher-end units, like the Tirithea Marksman, the damage should be sufficient to start doing some decent damage to them. This round is retinue, on the other hand. They are going to turn around and charge. That might be enough to skewer a troll or two, actually. In the end, it just didn't have the impact that you would want it to. Serpent Guard are going to come in as well and hunt them down. And with their speed, and with the numbers being what they are as well, those two units there getting skewered. And that one, is that his general as well? That would be... I don't think so, because it would have said, our general, please to field. Yeah, it wasn't him. But, a big loss that for PC-70 wasn't really able to get any value at all from a unit that is pretty expensive. Not up to the same expense as knights, but still, that's over a thousand florins that have effectively been flushed down the toilet. And... We know that you know, mistakes for the, the defenders are often multiplied tenfold later on. It's definitely not a, something which makes the game unwinnable, but it is a value hit that they are going to have to work to overcome now. And it also gives the attackers all the time in the world to set up an assault before moving in, whereas if cavalry was out here, you can panic them into making a move, but that isn't going to be the case here. Meanwhile, over here on the front, we have just a single unit of spears from Windy. Um, they're just out here. I'm not sure what they're doing. Maybe they're hoping to uh, hoping to draw some attention from some archers or something. That's not going to happen at this point. In fact, they're so far away from reinforcements, you might even be able to just overwhelm them by charging out. I can understand why the defenders wouldn't want to do that, because it is still risky, because then the attackers would probably mobilise. But, they're just out here. Some of them carrying their torches as the sun goes down. Meanwhile, archers in position. They are firing now, the Morano archers, but I can't imagine they're getting a huge amount of damage, to be honest with you. The wall is going to absorb quite a lot of this damage. Any units they do hit as well are going to be armoured up. Going to have their shields pointing in the right direction as well, so casualties to a minimum. And I think the defenders would do pretty well here, to be honest with you, to just hold their ground, absorb that damage. Two of their marksmen are over here, but you, know, you can see that you know, through sheer volume, there are quite a lot of arrows that are finding their way into Minas Tirith's streets, but there's not a lot of dead bodies here. I can see one, actually, over here. One Gondorium. And that is it. So yeah, if I were the defenders here, I'd definitely be counselling caution. And just allowing this to happen, basically. There are some situations which you have to, re to respond to when it comes to dealing with this sort of thing from attackers, but this isn't one of them, I don't think. Not yet. If they can get into the settlement and start sort of firing their arrows around with slightly better sight lines, then it becomes a little bit of a different proposition. You kind of have to respond to it there. I mean, this is a fairly hefty attacking army, isn't it? A lot of ranks of Mordor. They've got the Haradrim in tow. Some Black Guard of barad coming over. And then obviously there's the Witch Realm of Angmar as well bringing some of their really nasty tools, including the Witchers. None of the Witch Realm units, though. Not Well, none of the higher tier Witch Realm units. They have the Pikes, obviously, but they don't have the Black Guard or the Hammer Guard, by the looks of things. I'm a little bit surprised by that. It's not often you see that, but perhaps the money was such that they couldn't really afford that. And he went for Trolls instead, so it's interesting. I'd be really tempted by the Hammer Guard in these matchups, to be honest with you. They're hugely effective against armored units may not have the same staying power in melee as a heavy swordsman like the Pharisim Swordmasters, but the amount of damage and havoc they could cause among some of these more basic units when the attack begins is really very, very high. Another section of the wall does fall, so we're still here in the, effectively, the attacker's setup phase. You can see there is a little bit more movement. You can see the siege towers are starting to shuffle around a little bit. 
they're going to get into a position where they can potentially start um, moving in. But there, the units be using their ammunition here. Or is that just one of the towers, defensive towers? Fountain Guard here again. Fountain Guard on the front line. Better hope they don't get focused down by rangers or javelins in particular. It'll be a pretty useful and cost-effective tool for trying to break up Fountain Guard blocks. Horns of the White Tower are here as well. Again, with the uh, this is a unit which will be becoming a two-handed swordsman. And that intrigues me a little bit more, actually, for the Wardens of the White Tower. I think it will fit better, because I don't really think they're that much of a show-stopping unit at the moment. They're outclassed by too many other sword and board units, which is a shame for Gondor. They're still very good, obviously, at what they do, but I kind of class them in the same realms as something like the Cardinals Chosen, where they're decent, but compared to other offerings, they're just not quite up to the same level. A two-handed swordsman would be interesting, however, because you would imagine that they would have—they would be really packing on the armor, have like a big shield on their back to give them a pretty noticeable shield value, and that gives them a new edge, and also fits with what Gondor are all about. Meanwhile, starting to see some units get a little bit close now. Orc javelins coming forward. This is the kind of unit that it is worth going after with archers because yes, they're cheap, but they're reasonably easy to kill, and if you leave them to do their own thing, they're a unit which can do so much damage to you against key units as well, the Fountain Guard, so I would imagine that's what Windy is ultimately going to be going after. That's going to be the prize here. Because if you can kill off Fountain Guard with a unit as cheap as the Orc Javelins, you're definitely onto a winner. Around on infantry trundling around, so you can see here the attackers are definitely trying to sort of position themselves so they can collapse in all at once, which I definitely approve of. Most of the time we see the attackers lose a big siege battle like this, it's because they haven't committed in the correct fashion. And it kind of messes them up. On this occasion, though, it does look as though we're going to be seeing massed ranks pushed forward all at once, which I definitely approve of. However, these Orc Javelins are getting shot. You can see that immediately. It's a bit interesting for me that the Wardens of Minas Athel are being used to shoot them, to be honest with you. They're armor-piercing archers. Their ammunition could be used to much greater impact against something that's a little bit heftier. But at least they are shooting them with something. Although I would personally go for like a basic unit of archers or maybe something like the Marksman of Care Andros. And they're going to be doing damage to them. Any arrow that hits from the Wardens of Minas Athel with the damage they do is going to be more than capable of picking up kills. Some of them actually shrugging them off, so all javelins. That could be down to their shield value as well. They do have a shield value, even though they are made of wood, like it is. It does at least help in these situations. And there you can see the siege towers moving forward in the background as the orcs here on foot bide their time as well. Siege Tower's moving forward en masse at this point, so we're getting ever closer to the genuine start of this battle. Guardians of Khan Doom up on the wall, a little bit difficult to dislodge. In these numbers as well, like, it's going to be key here for the attackers. Like It's definitely the right thing to do. I've seen on Minas Tirith before, the attackers make the mistake of pushing forward not enough, and the defenders on the wall are able to just overwhelm. Numenorean Steel Bows are firing away. I'm not sure what they're firing at... Hopefully it's not the Orc Fodder. Something shooting the Orc Fodder, though. I would dearly hope that the Numenorean Shield Bows are not being used on Orc Fodder, but we shall see. Athalon Men at Arms up here on the walls. They should be sufficient to defeat Moran on infantry, to be fair. Their armour is better, and they're going to have access to better support as well. Dismounted Knights, the Silver Swan, and Parathil Champions are taking up positions over on this section of the wall, which Dole Amroth taking responsibility for this section over here, which does put them at the greatest risk. Obviously, if the defenders do decide to pull back, the units over here are often in the greatest risk of being left behind. So Dole Amroth definitely needs to keep an eye on that. I suppose with the Orc Javelins here, if they are absorbing armor-piercing arrows, they're technically doing their job as well. I think maybe I would prefer the Orc Javelins to be able to use their payload, though, as cheap as they are. The damage they can do to those mass ranks, especially of stuff like the Fountain Guard. Like, it's such a good tool. Guards of Osgiliath as well. Fully upgraded Gondor Spearmen alongside the Royal Legion of Armenolos as well over here, which... Yeah, I mean, the, they're just setting up their siege towers here, getting ready. You can see there the mount, the mass ranks of the massed ranks of the Muhards from Harad also getting ready. Numenorean Steel Bows firing their projectiles in. Again, are AP arrows the best thing to be shooting into Southron pikemen? Really, any old archer is going to be able to do a huge amount of damage to Southrons that are unshielded. But they are still going to guarantee a good amount of kills. 
and it takes away a potential armor-piercing phalanx that the attackers can utilize as well, so... Six of one, half a dozen of the other, I suppose, is what you would say about that. The ram coming in. The decorated gate of Gondor. It's going to be smashed down here. It's not quite so impressive as Grond, this ram, but there are limits to what we can do in Medieval 2. Dismounted Knights of the Silver Swan. They're going to be going after Snarga Stalkers. I mean, numbers might be an issue with Snarga Stalkers and Guardians of Cardoom. That might be just saturating the numbers of the Knights of the Silver Swan, though. They may need a little bit of help. Uh, but there are more Ethelon men at arms. There's more than enough Dol Amroth infantry to go around up on the wall zone here. And I think Dol Amroth should be fairly comfortable here in trying to defend the walls aggressively. Mainly because if they do, you know, they are at the greatest risk of getting left behind, like I said, so they may as well front load, do as much damage as they can. And against a single Mordor army with the support of Angmar, I think they'll be good enough to, to weather that storm for a good amount of time. And they do have some Gondorian support as well. Meanwhile, as the gate continues to be battered down, mostly Numenor are going to be holding the gate, with the walls of the White Tower from Gondor in tow. There are plenty of, of openings at this point. It's sort of a, it's an eerie battle, really, because nothing really has... No significant blows have been landed yet. You could argue the mid is retinue, but... So far, it's, it's one of those battles where when things start to kick into high gear, they really will start to get moving. And the attackers now... I mean, to be fair to the attackers as well, they've been allowed to move their army into a position where their reinforcements are pretty close. Which, again, is good for the attackers. They appear to be setting up an attack on all angles as quickly as possible and they have their reinforcements close by that their attacks aren't going to falter maybe to the extent that they otherwise would. Round on infantry charging in through the gates. The first orcs to enter Minas Tirith are immediately going to be met by Numenorean shield guard and the Belagai pikes are also going to squeeze in to offer that phalanx support. Again a classic combination of heavy spears and pikemen. Very very difficult to break down of course. A mass push will do the trick, but uh, there's a time and a place for that, and it's not while the defenders are still at largely full strength. Moran on guard are going to get destroyed by Fountain Guard, of course, and the support of the Guards of Osgiliath are coming in as well. Orc Javelins are moving forward with the Southron Pikemen, but yeah, I mean, they're going to need the support of the Javelins here to really do their thing. There's Olag High back there as well. Guards of Osgiliath pulling back because they know that they are probably going to be in range of the Orc Javelins, whereas the Fountain Guard are close as are the Numenorean steel bows, who are decent in melee. This is not the fight for the Olaikai, I don't think. Sending them in against Fountain Guard is very risky. The Olaikai will still take their fair share of kills, but... Like, the Fountain Guard is such a devastating unit of armor-piercing infantry that it's exactly the sort of thing you want against the... Meanwhile, the Snaga Stalkers were immediately thrown back by the Knights of the Silver Swan. <laughs> Feeling very comfortable here. I mean, the attack has begun on the other flank, so I feel as though Ranch B. Dressing should also be getting his men up the Siege Towers. Yes, Dol Amroth are in position here, looking strong. But like I said, sometimes there has to be a full guy for the attackers, and I think just attacking on all fronts is the, is the right answer here. Numenorean Cohort and Ravenhelm's of Care Andros up on the walls are going to be able to do some really, really nasty damage to the Moranon infantry. So... It started off pretty well for the defenders, but you would expect that. That's how it often goes. Fully upgraded Gondor Spears. A little bit less suited for the task, but they're still in a pretty commanding position. Round on infantry over here. Have actually managed to sort of secure a space up on the walls, interestingly enough. The Royal Legion of our are obviously going to defeat them, but there's an avenue for potential reinforcements to get up that siege tower. Is it going to be taken? Not right from the off. Hashari Stalkers are there as well, so some rangers on the attack. Demons of the Desert, so... The attacks, of course, got, have got a lot of tricks up their sleeve. Those javelins are being launched over the wall. They'll get a few kills, but not very many like that, to be honest with you. But yeah, Demons of the Desert, Witchers, Nazgul, Olag Haya coming in here. But you can see that they are struggling. Like, the Guards of Osgiliath have been added to the front line, I think, to try and prevent anything drastic from happening. But yeah, the, the Fountain Guard are going to be able to defeat the Guards of Osgiliath. More reinforcements are needed if they're going to push through here. Uh, meanwhile, the Olag Kai, Trolls of Gundabad actually from Angmar pushing in, Warns of the White Tower and Seafarers not being able to use their javelins as a result of that blitzing assault. There's still a lot of trolls being committed forward very quickly. They are being supported, but I can't help but wonder if these trolls have been committed into the right fights. Like, I feel as though alongside the Blackguard, when the defenders were weak enough for a mass push to work, probably would have been better. White streaks there from Rangers, which, yeah, it's the Athelian Rangers firing in. Potential for friendly fire there, but 
We'll see. I mean, trolls are here. Fountain Guard, like, they're just going to be so good against the trolls. That's the thing. Javelins coming in from the Seafarers as well. They're not quite as devastating as they used to be, but they still have a really high missile damage, to be honest with you. And they're decent in melee as well. Meanwhile, over here, still not really anything happening. I think they do need... Ah, uh, well, actually. One of the Siege Towers is being used. Brown on infantry immediately being met by Dismounted Knights of the Silver Swan with some Ethelon men at arms in the reserve. Yeah, that's not going to go too well. They, they need to be pressurising a little bit more than that, I think, Ranch be dressing. Newer player, so that may very well explain that. But, I mean, Y2K isn't a newer player, so, I mean, he should be more willing, I think, to push in, and he has been. He has pushed in to this section of the city over here. Snaga Stalker is obviously going to get destroyed by Ravenhelms in melee. You can see the trolls in the background there fighting through the main gate. More units coming in now. Black Swan Renegades will actually be pretty good against the upgraded Guardians of Khan Doom. There are gaps being uh, exploited here though. Star Killer X being a little bit slow. Not really squeezing in as quickly as would have been uh, would have been nice, but I can see why he wasn't, because those Witch Realm Scourge Raiders now have got a decent shot. They're being shot as well though, the Scourge Raiders, and they're not particularly good under arrow fire, so you can see there the Black Swan Renegades doing a good job there sandwiching this Angmar assault over here meanwhile. Seafarers. I mean, the trolls have done damage here. There can be no doubt about that. But have they done enough damage to justify them being pushed in so aggressively like that? I would question that. The assaults up on the walls over here. You know, the dying embers of those Orc Maulers getting finished off by the high-tier defensive infantry. Some Muhards are up on the wall now. Muhard Berserkers. And to be fair, against Gondorian Spearmen, they should be pretty good. But obviously, they've taken damage up till this point. So... They'll be able to make an impression. There's another unit of them on the way up here as well. This is good. They've, they've identified probably the weakest section of the defense on this wall, and they are pushing in on it pretty heavily. And that should coax more resources away from other places, which they can then pressurize in turn. The Royal Legion, meanwhile, I mean, credit to them around on infantry. They're still fighting, but obviously they're not making that much of an impression in terms of damage. The Royal Legion of Armandalo is really filling their pockets in terms of kills. With another unit of Muhad Berserkers up here, that should spell doom for these Gondor Spearmen, unless they get some support in double quick time. More Berserkers filtering their way in. Meanwhile over here, a big push in from the Black Guard of Baradur. Now this is a little bit of a chaotic situation for the defenders to deal with. Maybe they weren't expecting such an aggressive push in of infantry now. And that's going to force some of the defenders that were actually guarding the main gate to turn around as well. So there is... I mean, this is a dangerous situation. The defenders, I think, if they're serious about holding the bottom layer, they're going to need to send in another unit of serious infantry. I mean, the Seafarers have got a clear shot through this avenue. As soon as they're out of ammunition, though, they're going to need to muck in in melee. Warns of uh, Minister Thiel are already in there. Not very many of them, but I mean, still, individually an impressive unit. Shadow like Shadowbows look to be out of ammunition, interestingly enough, so they must have been shooting in. Again, very hard to keep track of ranged units and how well they're being used. So far, I think both sides have actually used their projectiles decently well. You know, maybe a little bit of overuse in the armor-piercing stakes for the defenders on units that aren't really all that impressive. But in come the Blackwatch Legion, bulldozing through a particularly lightly manned section of the line. Gondor infantry. This now, I think, would be the ideal time. I mean, Mordor, I think what they are waiting for, maybe this is the plan, maybe what Angmar are wanting, is to get Dole Amroth's attention down here, and then as this wall gets a little bit clearer, that's when Ranch B. Dressing can push in a little bit more aggressively. He's only using one siege tower so far, though, and most of his army appears to be blobbing up on it, which is not what you want to be doing. It's making Dole Amroth's job at bottling you up that much easier. And if you do look like you're making any sort of progress, the Haven Guard are going to be there to slam that door shut in your face. And I think Dole Amroth sees that weakness, and he is going to be moving across here to send more support over here. Gondor infantry fully upgraded, but again, these Blackwatch Legion, they are more impressive than the Black Guard in melee. But they can still be overpowered. You can see there, the Numenorian Steelbows, though, shooting point blank into their backs, and those are both good targets for armor-piercing archers. Guardians of Khan Doom and the Blackwatch Legion taking a huge amount of damage there. Also, regular damage coming in from the Tirithea Marksmen, but the shields are also pointing the wrong way, so... As soon as you get some of these Tarnostian spearmen in there. Spells trouble for Angmar. They have made this fight messy as well though. And if the fights get messy, that's where the orcs always tend to thrive. Black Swan Renegades getting overwhelmed a little bit now. Some support coming in just in time to save them from the Tarnostian spearmen. 
maybe not the caliber of support they were hoping for, but it's something at least. Guardians of Khan, yeah, like these Raven Helms have been far too strong for these units on the front line. Guardians of Khan Doom took a bit of damage from the rear from those Macemen from Double Amroth as well. In come the Moran on Halberdiers. You can see just these shit. Well, Veterans of Skill is shooting over some of these structures. They're going to have value in melee as well due to their unbreakable nature, though. Wanderers of Nimrodel have been in there as well, firing their projectiles, I'm sure. Seafarers being committed to melee. They have managed to sort of stabilize the situation over here. They didn't follow through enough, the attackers. Again, in much the same way as the trolls, they've committed forward a good portion of their Great Shield infantry at this point. And while they've made progress and did some damage, it wasn't for nothing. I don't think it was quite what they were hoping for either. Meanwhile, over here you can see the Muhad Berserkers. I mean, yes, they've managed to finish off some Gondor Spearmen. But there's Gondor infantry on the way over now to give them a little bit of a helping hand. And the Muhad Berserkers that were committed over here... They're really good. Like, they've done some damage, like they've killed five Royal Legionnaires, but I mean that's that's clearly not going to be uh, the kind of numbers that you're going to want to see from your units at the end. Units killed five is not going to be a good return regardless of what unit you are, unless you are possibly something like the Orc Fodder, where getting in the way is the main order of business. Orc Javelins actually pushing their way into a decent position, shooting into the back of this defensive line that includes the Wards of the White Tower. The defenders need to do something about that, because that is good value that you cannot afford to let Orc Javelins get. So, when, like, in, again, in a chaotic situation like this, if a player is paying attention like this, you can weasel your way into a good position, and all of a sudden, the Orcs, like, that is the sort of damage they're going to want to see. There's Sauron's Will on the front line from Teabagger as well, who are going to do a little bit better against some of these upper-end Numenorean units, especially with how depleted they already are. That armor-piercing damage is going to be very, very handy indeed. Muhad Beast Hunts coming in, so more Javelins. And this is some genuine progress. Whereas over here, I think Angmar are probably still going to be struggling. Dol Amroth have sort of shored things up. Numenor and Gondor sort of defending the route towards the gate. Dol Amroth guarding their section of city. There are some Orc Fellas in there. The equivalent to the Orc Maulers from Angmar. Or for Angmar, I should say. The Maulers are from Mordor. But yeah, you can see the Tarnostian Spearmen are pushed across, shored things up making sure that, you know, sheer numbers are not going to be enough to overcome the quality that's over here. And the Knights of the Silver Swan have descended from the wall to also guard this area. Blackguard of barad pushing in. That, I think, is the Dol Amroth General, actually, and that would probably be over here in the Haven Guard unit. Yeah, I mean, they're there. And you can see here that Mordor have committed a lot to this assault, actually, and the, it has technically worked out in their favour, the fact that it wouldn't be something I would recommend, pushing up through a singular siege tower, but Dol Amroth have had to siphon off more of their resources to help halt Angmar's progress, otherwise things would get really messy for the defenders. They still have all these Ephelon men at arms units and Parathal champions that have to guard these siege towers as well, but I think have to guard them is maybe maybe to a lesser extent at this point. Ranch be dressing though, being an, being an annoyance, which is a good role to play in this situation. Because your allies are starting to make things happen. Veterans of Skiliath out of ammunition. In comes some more Tarnostian Spears. They're trying to push through with the Black Guard of barad -dur, Following through with some Angmar Halberds as well. Is this going to be successful? We shall have to wait and see. I mean, they're going to take a lot of damage doing this. And do they have the manpower to be able to uh, carry this on? I'm not sure they do. But this is also, we're getting to the point now where something like the Witchers would probably be really, really devastating. Because there's a huge blob of Dol Amroth units here, and I'm not sure where they are, per se. I'd be watching them like a hawk if I was playing the game, though. They would absolutely be the sort of thing that, if I was on the same section of the map as Angmar, I would want to be keeping track of them at all times. Keeping an archer in the back pocket to try and shred through them. Ideally, the Wanderers of Nimrodel. Speaking of rangers, the Athelian rangers are in position here, getting into a position where they can shoot through that gap in the wall, try and do as much damage as possible to the attackers on the approach. And they're going to do so. Southron's back there, Muhards, easy kills for rangers. Maybe not the most glamorous units to be killing, but they're going to be killing them in high numbers. Numenorean cohort trying to shore things up. They're going to destroy Blackguard of Barad during melee. They'll actually be all right against troll drummers as well. Troll drummers not really the sort of thing you want in close melee with upper-end infantry like this, to be honest with you, but here they stand. Meanwhile, up here on this section of all Serpent Guard, like Harad have been trying to sort of filter in units, keep these units occupied, which you do need to do, to be fair. Like, normally I'm not a fan of, like, sort of sending in units one by one just to be slaughtered, but 
you need to keep these units up on the wall so that your progress on the lower ground through the gaps and through the gate is able to be maintained without reinforcements being able to come across. You need to keep the enemy occupied as best you can. And Harad were always going to be playing more of a supporting role here. Their Demons of the Desert are still potentially a really, really useful tool. Serpent Guard are a good unit, but not quite up to the standards of Ravenhelms and Numenorean Cohort. Trolls over here. I mean, still over here is where the battle is at its messiest. Uh, there's a lot of empty space at this point. Neither side really rushing in to occupy it. Windy is now with his Hawk Javelins. They could do a pretty decent amount of damage. Numenorean Steel Bows being brought across. They could charge into melee and do a decent job of holding. The attack through the gate has been sort of slow at this point. Steady, but slow. Guardians of Khan Doom defeat seems certain. Yeah, and I mean, we're seeing units that are going to be able to overpower Guardians of Khan Doom in terms of quality, which is the key here. Angmar's assault at this point has started to uh, peter out pretty badly. I mean, this is where I can see that I saw the witches just then. There goes one of the attacking generals. And the witches are over here. I mean, certainly this part of the settlement represents the best possible value proposition for the witches. I mean, look at that. That huge blob of primarily Dol Amroth troops, but with a few Gondorians mixed in there as well. I mean, there's Nimlothian Honor Guard that are potentially sallying forth. I can understand their, their want for destruction, but it's... Is it really worth going after Orc Fellas, potentially losing your Nimlothian Honor Guard at the hands of the Witches just to kill some Orc Fellas? It puts the pressure on, but at this point the Nimlothians are committed. If they turn their backs, they're, they're in trouble. Like, they're in. And I think they may well live to regret that. I think the Witches will probably be waiting for a bigger blob than just the Nimlothians, but it would be very, very tempting, I think, for um, for Y2K to try and get into a position to grill them. Maybe they will. We shall see. Meanwhile, Orc Javelins. Windy's done a good job at positioning his Orc Javelins so far, I have to say. Finishing off those Numenorean cohort that did ultimately kill the trolls. But the, the Javelins have been like hiding in plain sight in many ways. And the defenders haven't shut them down quickly enough. Like, they're a cheap unit of javelins, but they're going to do the business here. And that Numenorean cohort, which was, you know, it would have been around sort of 30, 35 strong, have now been finished off effectively by javelins. Fire arrow is being utilised by the March and the Carandros to try and break what's left. Trollmen are now up on the walls. That is a different proposition entirely for the Numenorean cohort to deal with. Still a few Serpent Guard. I mean, you can see there that there are Rangers shooting in, which should be enough to honestly do a lot of damage to those Trollmen. They don't have the best armor, so once their hit points are gone, uh, they're going to do a lot of damage to them. But they're forcing them to use their Ranger ammunition, at, at least at this point. Royal Legion, a little bit scattered, actually, on the on the walls at this point. Numenorean Steel Bows coming into support. Those Muhad Beast Hunters actually firing in from the Siege Tower. It's a little bit difficult to do that purposely, to be honest with you, but they're doing it. And the Royal Legion of Armenelos taking some damage. Meanwhile, the Serpent Guard have actually flooded in. They've actually taken good advantage of a gap here. Getting into the Marksmen, they do need to be careful. Because, of course, there are still Spearmen at large. But charging in there and causing chaos, which is exactly what the attackers want. They want to see more gaps. They want to be able to flood in and do that damage. Meanwhile, I can see the green fog of where the Witchers once were. There's a lot of dead uh, veterans of Osgiliath there, but it doesn't look like it was... Well, I mean, it's hard to tell because there were already so many bodies there, but clumps of bodies? I mean, it did look damaging, to be fair, but not match-endingly damaging. A few Serpent Guard getting finished off there. Tarnostian Spearmen are over here. What is going on over on this section now, where Dol Amroth still have resources? I mean, they pushed across with more of their Athlon men at arms still. Ransby dressing is persisting with this one Siege Tower approach. Um, it was working to an extent, but now it's it's going to start going back the other way. Now he's just f f feeding kills into uh, Dole Ambrose infantry. And that's not what you want to be doing, really. So we get up close and personal. I mean, the Orc Maulers. I mean, in theory, the Orc Maulers and Moran on Halberds are actually... Actually, those are Moran on Guard, never mind. But yeah, the Orc Maulers are actually pretty good against these uh, Western Men-at-Arms style units. Moran on Guard won't be so much, though. But numbers depleting. Uruk captains are still there. I mean, just look at this. Like, I, I'm not sure what he's trying to do here, but I, I can't imagine that that was purposeful. But at the end of the day, it's still been somewhat useful. I heard the Harajim horn blaring in the distance there as they push in to try and really uh, put some pressure on. I mean, Southron archers are going to get butchered in melee. They're going to try shooting point blank. In come the Orc fellas to try and envelop 
the gatehouse defence. Palagia Marines are fighting hard to try and prevent them from doing so. Which are on pikemen are there. Tarnosti and Spearmen are pushed across to try and help shore things up. But I mean, it is getting more desperate for the defenders at this point, you'd have to say. They're starting to commit units in and try and trying to plug gaps with units that maybe aren't the best. Wanderers of Nimrodal are going to get closed in on by Southrun pikemen. I mean, they're not going to last long if they start getting shot by something like the Adunaim Shadow Bows. They're already shaken. They're in a little bit deep without any support. But they're preventing that those rangers from firing into the assault on the gate. That's going to kill them in double quick order though. The troll men were finished off pretty heftily by them as well, to the point where the Ravenhelms and the Numenorean cohorts are still holding on to this section of wall up here. And yeah, Numenor and Gondor triumphant up on the walls. But that was always going to be the case. I don't think Harad went in here fully expecting to be able to take the walls. Those white streaks signifying the ranger arrows. Southron archers being finished off by Numenorean cohort to the surprise of absolutely no one. Southron pikemen are routing following their rough treatment at the hands of the Adunaim shadow bows. Are the witches still up and operational? They look like they only did one volley, so I would imagine they probably are. But who knows? They could have all been shredded pretty quickly by archers and we never would have noticed because that is the witches by their nature. You really want to be doing that if you can as well. Still a unit of Blackguard of Baradur sitting in reserves. They still have some pushing power. Meanwhile, up here on the walls, a real heavyweight clash here between the Nimlothian Honor Guard and the Temple Guard. Um, the Nimlothians should win that. They've got a little bit of support as well from uh, some Dole Amroth units here and there. Numbers advantage. Temple Guard are ultimately archers, you know, first and foremost as well. So Temple Guard trying to get into a position to use their arrows, I would assume, and not being allowed to. This is a bit of a concern for the defenders, though. Melkor's Chosen are now running roughshod in the back lines, and they're going to be more dangerous than Serpent Guard. Some hefty charges from them is going to be a real problem, as you can see from the routing Dole Amroth units that they are in and amongst. There is a cluster of Dole Amroth units there which are just begging for a charge. They could charge into the back of the veterans of Osgiliath as well though. Arrows are not going to be enough to stop them either, so yeah, this is going to be a big, heavy, well, not the best charge to be honest with you, but that should still be enough to give the attackers the impotence to push through the gate. Ran on infantry coming forward, some orc archers are out of ammunition, but just numbers coming forward at this point, flooding forwards. The Melkor's chosen, really just getting in and amongst it. They're going to try and get into the Marksman of Karandros, and they will succeed, although they'll give it back in melee, the Marksman of Karandros. There goes the Angmar general. So he has fallen. Melkor's chosen pushing in. Again, it's just quite messy, this. They can't really get a clean charge off because there's so many units pulling back at this point. And that is going to be the order of the day, I think. The defenders are going to start trying to pull back. And like I kind of feared, Dole Amroth have been left behind. So the defenders maybe didn't organise that as well as they otherwise could have. There's still a lot of prized assets, really, that they have effectively left. And that's not really what you want to be doing. Parathor champions pushing through. They still have a good chance to actually do some good damage down here at the very least. Those Nimlothians are going to be able to finish off the Temple Guard, for example, which is an important important target. They're trying to pull through, trying to pull back with as many of their units as they possibly can, but Serpent Guard are probably going to charge into the rear of them. There's Tarnosti and Spearman. I think there's Haven Guard in there, is there not? No, there isn't. Well, I mean, finally, this one siege tower has been uh, conquered by Rajvi Dressing. He's going to be able to push forward, but yeah, I mean, Serpent Guard with Melkor's Chosen running around. And they're going to try and finish them off here by collapsing in on them, which should work with the amount of numbers they have, Parathor champions will probably be enough to rout them as well with the fear they they instill in their foes in melee. But the window for them to actually escape their fate is uh, is running out. And if the witches are still operational, that represents a pretty good blob to to grill, to be honest with you. Meanwhile, Athlon men at arms are routing. Yeah, the Melkor's chosen have been a real issue, haven't they? Doing the business. These units up on the walls are still fighting. To be fair against Southron Pikemen, but they're going to win because of their phalanx by the games reckoning. These units need to be retreated. Like It's been a retreat, but it's not been a particularly orderly retreat at all by the uh, defenders. And that could be what ends up costing them the game, honestly. They've done pretty well up to this point. Mithrandir's retinue loss was a bit of a shame for them, but... Uh, it's around on archers are there. I don't know, I mean, that like Dole Amroth are actually giving this a good go down here, considering they have been hung out to dry, really, by their two allies. 
There's still a few Gondorians left over here as well, but yeah, you can see here Moran on archers firing in through the gap. Moran should be dressing, trying to get some good value with his basic archers. Should be able to get a few good kills, especially with a unit that's as healthy as this one. Their utility in melee will be much more limited though, of course. More Moran on archers back here as well, who look to be out of ammunition, but that's just more bodies for the, the front line. Hashari Stork is moving in. In looking around, the attackers don't have that much infantry left, but I think the same could be said for the defenders, to be honest with you, as we look. Royal Legion of Armenolos, Numenorean Steel Bows. And further back, I mean, they do still have the Pharisim Swordmasters, which is a, a real heavyweight to have in the late game. Steel Bows. Once again, we're going to be seeing this choke point used, which why wouldn't you on Minas Tirith? I mean, this choke point is so effective. But if they haven't left enough in reserve, the defenders, then just a single unit of Black Guard of barad could be enough to destroy their hopes and dreams. Especially if the Witches are still operational. Demons of the Desert are still loitering around. There they are. Still these Dole Amroth units that have been left behind are still running around trying to make something happen. As you hear, they're in melee against Moran on Archers. I mean, to be honest with you, Dole Amroth can really do quite a bit of damage over here. Dismounted Knights of the Silver Swan. Doing some good things. Run on archers also there, but again, it's it's just a matter of cleanup for the attackers here, but they do need to be a little bit careful. They're having to use the Black Guard of Baradur to block the retreat of the Dole Amroth units. I mean Parathil Champions will do a lot of damage to Black Guard in sustained melee, but I would say that this is a good thing for the attackers to do. They can't afford to let these Dole Amroth units link up. Like, you need to punish the defenders for not giving Dole Amroth the heads up that the retreat was happening. <laughs> Nimlothian Honor Guard are also stuck out here as well. I mean, these are a lot of units which you do not want to be facing in a choke point. Nimlothian Honor Guard especially, but also Parathal Champions. That fear can really be a problem. Serpent Guard with a very weak charge into the Nimlothian Honor Guard, which they will be made to pay for. Pretty savagely, I would imagine. No longer command the city, eh? Oh, of course, chosen. Still eight of them. They've already done their job, though. They already made it very, very messy in behind. Hashari stalkers are up here. They have been closed down by some very depleted Numenorean cohort, but there's no real danger there. Rangers more than capable of looking after themselves in melee. Are they going to shoot them point blank? I think they are. I think that's a little bit of a waste, to be honest with you. Like, a full volley of ranger ammunition is much better used than going after a unit that's already going to die. And ultimately, they didn't end up getting many kills for that either. Just get a unit of infantry up there to help them. Blackguard. Do we see him certainly? You can see over here which one Pikeman also pushing in, helping to shore things up. And this is going to be the end of Dole Lanroth and the Nimlothians. I'm sure they'll fight to the bitter end, but they have been left behind. And they'll have to lay down their lives because uh, this little cluster of units over here has been doing pretty well pretty consistently. The Tarnostian Spearmen, though, are on the verge of routing. They've got cavalry in their back lines. They're running up against Moran on archers, though, so I mean, as long as that cavalry doesn't cause them to rout, I'd expect them to stabilise, to be honest with you. Knights of the Silver Swan are going to be pro providing that morale boost to them as well. Could be sufficient to finish off the Moran on Archers, which is better than nothing. I do think Dol Amroth has done pretty well so far in the given situation. But there's going to be a lot of units heading their way. It's a lot of fodder by the looks of things with Moran on infantry, but still. Units on the way. Going to be able to overwhelm what's left of them. What is going on here? Well, they're routing. But they're routing through the enemy. Meanwhile, the Nimlothians will stand and fight to the bitter end. They're actually going to win against the Morale on Infantry. <laughs> but with all the reinforcements on the way across, I wouldn't be too concerned for them. They should do just fine. Tarnostian Spearmen, they're routing as well, so yeah, they've been finished off. Knights of the Silver Swan will probably stand and fight for a little bit longer, but all chance of victory has now deserted them because they are now hopelessly outnumbered. And that is going to be the end of that. Rather luminous over here. There doesn't even seem to be any torchlight. It just seems to be the buildings are a little bit more uh, enlightened. Fodder are there. Still the Serpent Guard. I mean, the, the mounted units are not really going to play too much of a part in the final phase of this game, I would imagine. The walls have been secured. And that's pretty much that. I think it's just the Nimlothians that remain. 
Yeah. Oh, well, actually, they did rout in the end, four of them, but they did end up routing, so now... The entrance to the city, the first layer, has been taken by the Orcs and the Southrons. And now, how will they progress forwards? How will they go about taking this choke point here? Interestingly enough, more of the action happened on the first layer than we've seen in um, on Minas Tirith. Like, one thing I don't like about Minas Tirith is when the defenders fall back earlier and turn this into just a really dull blob fight. Um, that isn't going to happen this time though, because there simply isn't the manpower for both sides for that to happen. It's going to come down to something quite short and quite sweet, I think. And let's have a look. I mean, they're going to be going up against Pharaohs and sword masses. There's going to be archers in compromising positions. Blackguard of Baradur, I mean, they have enough to push through, but they're going to have to push through at the right time, so Teabagger's judgement is going to be uh, have to be good. The catapult is there, which could be a problem, depending on where the defenders position themselves on the hill. Depleted pikes, there's a lot of fodder, so they have at least some margin for error. Champions of Nafrat, very strong unit. Maybe not quite on the same level as the Pharisim sword masters because of that third hit point they have, but hugely effective unit of armor-piercing shock infantry that, which will be very useful. Lot of round on infantry. Demons of the Desert still so effective. I'm not seeing the Witches, to be honest. Which may be a sign that they were defeated. And we could see them uh, phase into existence a little bit later on. Walk fodder, marching through the streets. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be close this one, certainly. I think a lot of it comes down to whether the attackers can use their heavy hitters or not, whether they can use their demons and their catapult. If they can do that, then I think uh, they're in for a good time. Meanwhile, I'm not really sure what the Melkor's Chosen were thinking here. Although, to be fair, they actually did catch the Palagir Marines out, so fair play to them. And only Gondor Infantry came down to support them. That's not an anti-cavalry unit either. So the Melkor's Chosen continuing to get some little pieces of good value there. Some two Athlon men at arms charging into the rear of them. Credit to Mordor there. The Melkor's Chosen, which were looking to have already fulfilled their purpose, getting just a little bit more done. And it's, you know, by these margins, the battle could be decided, so good awareness there. Still some Royal Legion, fighting hard throughout the entire battle, and there's still 20 of them remaining. Naru and Aru Sentinels are, I mean, this is the thing, like, they're going to have to use their heavy hitters, the attackers, like their catapult, demons mass pushing, that sort of thing, because if they get bogged down in just a pure fight, a pike of this quality, at this stage in the game, is going to be insurmountable, to be honest with you. They're losing manpower, though. They can't really afford to lose. It's pretty sloppy, to be honest with you. Do they even have any anti-cavalry units, though? I don't think they really do, do they? Other than the pikes. But they don't want to commit the pikes forward yet. They have their rangers in position from Katunka. That, I think, is going to be fairly key, because they're in a good position to shoot into the backs of the attacks as they move up. What the attackers cannot afford to do is be drawn into a fight where they're pushing downhill. They need to let the... Well, the attackers, the defenders, sorry. The attackers, they need to force the attackers to, to be the ones to push up. So they have the advantages with their rangers. Also, obscuring the catapult somewhat. <laughs> Firing in there with some fire arrows. I don't know whether they hope to catch these artillery pieces on fire. They might, if they're very lucky, they might get one of them set alight. Again, like the Melkor's Chosen are just going to push forward. And again, this is poor, I have to say, from Beastie. Very poor. Like, this was always going to happen. Unless you've got anti-cavalry right there. I don't understand what he was expecting to accomplish with that. It's not the worst thing in the world, but, like, that's two soldiers. Two March from the Karandros that fell. And it, it wasn't, wasn't good. I have to say. But there needs to be a bit of awareness. Uruk Captains, that's an important unit as well. Armour Piercing, are they going to be the first ones in? Looks like they might be. There's no real reason why they shouldn't be either. I mean, they will give the Numenorean Steel Bows in melee the business. And the Royal Legion of Armenlos are depleted as well, so maybe they don't even um, offer the challenge to the uh, Uruk Captains. I mean, they're going to push forward to Morale on infantry first, but they definitely don't want to put the Uruk Captains too far behind, and unfortunately I think Ranch be dressing. It's the sort of thing I've come to expect from a newer player, to be honest with you. They just refuse to send their elites in, even in a situation where they would probably be the thing that's called for. But, you know, such is life. They may very well end up learning the hard way here. 
if they allow their manpower to get ground down by the defenders, they don't stand a chance. Heavy hitters or no. The Melkor's chosen are going to move forward. One Tirithea marksman and one Athelon men at arms joins the fray. These Melkor's chosen have been far more awkward than uh, they had any right to be, really. Some of it comes down to the fact that the Sentinels, they're being held back just a little bit. Understandably so, but this, I think, is going to be the key unit here. The Demons of the Desert, it's going to be... Uh, them or bust, but I think to get into a position where they fire, they would have to put themselves in harm's way of the rangers, which is not great for them. They're multiple HP, but in much the same way as Berserker class units, they are very bad under arrow fire as soon as their hit points are gone. And rangers are the last thing you want to be giving free hits to. 14 Gondor infantrymen pushing forward. I mean, it is going to be interesting here. They have a lot of quality here, the defenders left in melee, but do they have enough? to go on to win this fight. I mean, the Melkor's Chosen have now been uh, have now been dealt with. <laughs> Everything they have been pushed in, except for the Pharazim Sword Masters for the time being. When the time is right, I'm sure they will prove to be a devastating tool to be used as well. Numenorean Steel Bows. What happened to the Rangers? Oh, there they are. I'm blind. I was right above them. They're firing down the hill. There's attacking Rangers as well. Numenorean Steel Bow, Sword Ammunition, so they have some good ranged units. Fire Arrows, some of them hit in the deck. Don't know if that morale debuff will necessarily be enough to make anything significant happen. I mean, this is it. This is really for all the marbles. The Troll Drummers, I'm not really sure what's going on here. Sort of a phase retreat. Maybe they're trying to get them out of the way for, uh, for the Rangers and the Demons of the Desert. That is the way the attackers win this game, I think. If they don't do that, and I do think they get ground down by the Sentinels and the Pharaohs and Swordmasters. Because they have some, they have Uruk Captains, they have Champions of Nafrat, but they're fighting uphill into a pike block with some decent range support around it, which means you know, sheer might on its own is not going to be enough here for the attackers. But they need to be prepared to push forward when they can. They definitely have decent numbers left, enough numbers I would say. Champions of Nafrat are way too far away though. Demons of the Desert have also retreated further back. Hoping to wear them down just a little bit before delivering the hammer blow, I suppose. Whether that will actually come to fruition, I'm not sure. Neither side seems too eager to use their resources at this point, but that's going to play more into the hands of the defenders, I think, as they continue to hold the line. And now you can, you're starting to see units of 50 break. Which is not good, because you still need the numbers if you're the attackers. When push comes to shove, you're going to need to try and overwhelm the Sentinels and the Swordmasters. The support they've got around them is enough to sort of keep them propped up as well. <laughs> Maybe the Adunaim Shadowbows ran out of ammunition there. They were using their ammunition earlier after all, so they're going to pull out their swords and try and make something happen in melee. But, I mean, the defenders, they are running out of man manpower at this point. And the problem is, I think eventually what's going to happen here is they're going to run out of things to counter the demons and the rangers with. And when that happens, I think they're doomed. Even with their melee power, I think they're not going to have enough. We'll see, though. It's going to be interesting. You can see over here the Royal Legion sort of... They've been pushed off to the side a little bit. The Black Guard of Baradur sort of perpetually routing in the middle there. 141 Orc fodder moving in. To try and help things. I mean, the fatigue is going to shoot up on a hill of this size. Which is going to favour the defenders as well, but... Not sure how. Not sure how much of a factor that's going to be. Re you know, they've got the reinforcements on hand should they be necessary. But yeah, I mean, fodder is not going to be enough to turn around this fight in melee. I do not believe. Here comes the fodder, though, nonetheless. Fodder is best used when it's combined with something a little bit more robust. But I can understand them not wanting to commit their champions of Nafrat just yet, because that is the biggest heavy hitter in melee that they still have left the attackers. Harad's judgment is going to be called in. The Uruk captains are still around somewhere, though, and they may be better to send in first armor piercing. Shielded as well, so any straight arrows will be less likely to have a big impact on them. But I would imagine that the way we're going here is we're going to save them till last. And by that point, it, the match could already be decided one way or the other. I mean, yeah, these, these fodder are going to are going to break in double quick order. They're, they've got basically no support on the front line at this point. And they're going up against some of the meanest units in the business from Numenor. Defeat seems certain. Only a military genius could win this battle. 
Could a military genius make Orc Fodder win in an uphill fight against Nara and Aru Sentinels and Royal Legion of Armenolos? I think not. I think that's I think that's the impossible dream. In come the Uruk captains now though. Better late than never, perhaps? Because they are hemorrhaging manpower here, the attackers. Like they had advantages that they could use. I can understand them not wanting to put effectively their match winning units on the line, but you know, you need to take risks. As we all know, the biggest risk in life is to take no risks at all. And that may be the undoing of the attackers here, as more and more of their men start to rout. Numenorean steel bows getting into a position now as well to try and use their armor piercing arrows. What they have left anyway. They've got a very limited uh, ammunition supply of course, but also 92 heavily armored Numenoreans in melee is also something they're going to want sooner rather than later I think. You can see that at this point the rangers are in a decent position to shoot into the front line. Nara and Iris Sentinels though heavily armoured and shielded, probably the toughest pike to shoot in this manner and effectively kill. But against rangers that really counts for very little because of how, how much damage spread the rangers have. Some more damage being delivered by the steel bows though. Don't know how much ammunition those shadow bows still have left, but the stalkers should still have a decent amount of ammo left. At the end of the day, this is the final boss for the attackers. They're still going to have to find a way to deal with the Numenorean, um, well, yeah, technically the Numenorean heavy hitters, the Pharisim Swordmasters. I think that's probably what they intend to use the Demons of the Desert for, if I'm being honest. If I had to guess, I think that would be the plan. Catapult being trundled into place. Rangers are still there. So I'm forced to conclude that the Witchers got one half decent volley off and then were shredded by arrows. I'm kind of glad I wasn't on site to see that, to be honest with you, because that more than likely would have resulted in a crash, considering how the Witchers have treated me lately. Still a lot of fodder. I mean, that's the thing, like, it looks pretty bad for the defenders. I mean, there's a steady stream of attackers which eventually you'd back to overwhelm the front line, but the problem is, a lot of it is made up of units which they're not going to bat an eyelid up. The Uruk captains are getting towards the front line now, and that will make a big difference. Victory almost a certainty now, but... I mean, I think at this point... They're, they're trying the defenders to uh, to shoot into some of the, uh, the dangerous targets, but considering the terrain, it's actually not working in their favour one of the reasons why I said you really want the fight to happen up here, not on the hill itself. They were baited into sort of pushing forward a little bit, I think, the defenders. We'll see if that has a huge impact on the outcome of this battle or not. Because if the catapult gets a good hit, or if the demons of the desert are able to shred the line, to me that indicates that that did have a big impact. No sentinels, though. They haven't taken many losses at all, have they? And that's because the calibre of opposition they've been fighting up to this point has been very low. And they've been able to get, you know, slowly ratchet up the kill count. They're Uruk captains now, but now the composition of the front line is such that they're able to just really do their thing. And like I said, like they are the best pike to have in this situation because of their heavy armor and because they have their shields on the front. So at dealing with this kind of pressure, they're going to be even better than Imladris sentries, First Legion pikes, even the Karaskaladhons guardians with their two hit points. The heavy armor and shields are going to be better in this situation. I think all three of those other pike units overall are probably stronger than the Nara and Aru Sentinels, but in this situation, they are the very best you could ask for. Now they're back down the hill. Still ammunition on these rangers. But, I mean, are they going to be able to utilize it all? This front line is... I mean, it says victory seems certain for Mordor. I'm not convinced by that, especially not with stuff like this. 42 Orc Fodder. Routing off. Allies have fled the field like cowards. I, I mean, that's a bit harsh on Dol Amroth. I think their final man died in the middle of that mix there. And those rangers still going in. Those Karandros marksmen slowly but surely are grilling a lot of those uh, units that are on the way up the hill. So, I mean, it is having an impact. Every little helps. Man, it is warm today, let me tell you. This is going to be the only one I record today, because... Man. Shari Stalkers are there, so, I mean, yeah, we, we see back here, it really is 
Like, there's some orc fodder coming back from ranch be dressing, but demons, champions, in terms of, like, hefty power, that's pretty much what they have. Catapult. Might be worthwhile getting the catapult into. I mean, the thing is, with at this angle, the catapult also runs at the very real risk of hitting its own man. Which, considering the flaky morale of orcs, that could be game over for them if they make that mistake. If they push down the hill far enough, the Numenorean steel boats could take up a position to shoot down a little bit more easily. Back come 98 orc fodder. I can't imagine they'll be in melee for very long, to be honest with you. What is going on here? Look at these absolute champions. Oh my god, look at that. The, the Medieval 2 graphics don't know how to handle that. He is effectively 2D as he goes up a hill of that scale. But they've made it, and they are stopping the marks on the Karandros from firing. So they've managed to find a little bit of a gap there. They could do some decent damage, although I think if, you know they could charge into the Pharaohism Sword Masters and just get just get butchered, really. So who knows? Now in Iris Sentinels, they are taking losses slowly but surely at the hands of the Rangers, but not quite to the extent that many units would. They're getting hit in the back now, though, the Naran Iris Sentinels from Cavalry. I mean, they're getting... As soon as those pikes poke once, that spells doom for a Cavalry unit. As Minas Tirith often does, though. Pretty all-action first layer. And then a slow grind to determine who wins on the hills. And I'm still not sure, to be honest with you. I think, I'm, I think the attackers have been a little bit too slow burn here, if that makes any sense. Like they need to risk something at some point, otherwise their infantry will just fall apart the seams. They don't stand a chance in melee like this. Like They're not gaining anything at this point. They're only losing. Like They're trying to use their rangers to kill the Nara and Ari Sentinels, but at this point it's not having the impact that you would want it to. It says victory seems certain still, but like I said, I, th I do think that the, att the defenders have been guilty of this as well. Like There does come a point, I think, where you, you do need to heed the warnings the game is giving you. As the orcs continue to flood uphill. The rangers are now getting into melee. They do nine shadow bows. That should be the signal, I think, to send some reinforcements in. Even if those steel bows haven't used up their ammunition, there's a very real argument for putting them into melee at this point. Because those pikes need help. The Pharaohism Sword Masters even could be sent in, I think, at this point. Then it would coax the Demons of the Desert forward. Opportunity then for the Steel Bows to use their AP arrows to good effect. And possibly even win the game by doing that. But time will tell, because I'm still not entirely sure, to be honest with you. If we have a look at the percentage of kills, the defenders are losing by a single percentage point at this point. But look at the quality of the defending units that are left especially them. It represents a big spike on anything the attackers have. Yes, the champions of Nefra are very strong, but if you were to send the two units against one another, the third hit point makes a big difference. A big difference. There goes another general. Exactly what the defenders would have been hoping for. It's the sort of thing that uh, can potentially send a unit into, uh, send an army into freefall. I mean, this should really be the signal that the defenders need to send more to the front line, because they're trying to push through. I mean, that's a lot of routing coming off now. A lot of the sort of lower-end stuff is now turning tail and running. Here we go. Pharaohism Swordmasters. I mean, they're in no danger of being shot, actually, from this angle, so it makes a lot of sense. And those are Dunaim Shadow Bones going to get destroyed by the mightiest swordsman in the game. Those pikes have taken damage at this point, though. There's only 18 of them remaining, so actually in close quarters... When the formation started to get buckled, those Uruk captains did do the business. And unsupported, the Pharaohism Swordmasters will have a bit of a task on their hands. In come the champions of Nafarat. So this is it. I mean, this is where, really, the match is won and lost. Can the Pharaohism Swordmasters beast it out, or will the attackers be able to position themselves in such a way that they defuse the situation? a lot of routing going on though like this is the thing like all of this support it all of these supporting units which would have been fresher earlier on they're off like they're, they're leaving the battlefield at this point not wanting to stick around to get disemboweled by the pharaohism sword masters and who can blame them demons of the desert getting closer but the angle isn't right for the demons those marksmen of Karandros still slowly but surely killing things 
Like they've been really trying to get these steel bows into position, but I think Katunka at this point, he needs to just shoot from somewhere. Even if it's up in the air and looping shots, just because I can see that he's not going to commit this unit to melee until it's used its ammo, but melee may be the answer here. Getting that manpower on the front line, because I mean, this is exactly what the attackers are doing, to be honest with you. The Demons of the, De Demons of the Desert, a unit that hasn't used its ammo yet, is being committed to the fight, because they do still have a good amount of strength to offer, and now they're pushing through. And from Valkarion, that could be, or Valsarion. Valkarion, I think, is sounds more correct, but... With that move, being bold, they could have just won the game. Because, I mean, the Demons of the Desert, as soon as they get all of them through, they could turn around, and one volley is enough at this point. One volley breaks the back of this, I think. If they don't get a volley off, however, that could be enough to give victory to the defenders, to be honest with you, because the Pharisim sword masses have done a lot of damage as they push through. Uh, they're going to charge back into melee, That's, and they're getting shot at this point. They've given the Steel Bows a chance. I, th I think it'd be harsh on Harad here, because... They tried to make something happen, and I think ultimately it isn't going to work for them. Those armor-piercing arrows are going to give them, yeah, they're going to give them the business, aren't they? It's a real shame, actually, because I think Harad had the right idea there. And I always want to praise people who want to be bold and on the front foot and, and try and make something happen like that. Unfortunately, however, I think on this occasion it hasn't worked. Armor-piercing arrows now finding their marks as well. Champions of Nafarat. Yeah, the Pharisee and Sword Master is going to be able to beast this out, aren't they? Especially with the support they still have to come from the Steel Bows in melee. I think the Steel Bows are going to close in. I mean, Demons of the Desert, 12 of them are still enough to do some significant damage. Marks Macar Andros grilling yet another important target. Grilling really has been the word of the day, really, hasn't it? They're trying to get away, but it's not going to be enough, is it? Numenor and Steel Bows are going to hunt them down. To the ends of the earth, Pharazim sword masses actually now. If he seems certain, are you sure about that? Our Pharazon here and his uh, golden pope part is getting passed around a little bit by these champions. I mean, they are actually fighting relatively evenly. Having said that, there are Uruk captains in there as well, which uh, were a little bit healthier a moment ago. So that obviously does skew the results of the test somewhat. And demons of the desert would have been swinging as they push as they push through. I mean, I don't really know what the point of this is, personally. It's, it's not going to achieve anything in the long run. Yeah, half hours on. Killed off. He has fallen. If anything, they could end up actually um, awakening these Belagaya pikemen once again. One of the things that you can do when you uh, go into perpetually routing units like that is you can make them come back from routing because they're in the town centre. Which wouldn't be great. I mean, it's, it's probably a last-ditch thing from Valkarion to try and win. It's not going to work. Like, there's simply too many steel bows there. Catapult, trying to do its thing. Finally going after the Marksman of Care Andros. They've been slowly but surely little flea bites onto the attacking army. Pharazim Swordmaster 32. They're trying to push through with the champions of Nafrat. All in for Harad. They're going to go for the TC. It's not going to work. One of the attacking armies falls. That was not the Uruk captain, so Ranchby Dressing is still there. Y2K, it's not him either. It might be Windy. His army finally giving up the ghost. Last one of are there. I mean, they haven't. And demons are all gone at this point. And now the Steel Bow is going to be able to turn around. And with their arrival on the front line, I think that will be that. And the defenders will defend the White City, albeit not very many Gondorians left standing now, is there? Mostly just pure Numenorians. I'm sure Castamir will be pleased with that. In a roundabout way, he's got what he wanted in the end after all. In come the Steel Bows, that should be sufficient. Still one Serpent Guard left. That surely will be the end of him. Indeed it is. Brutally gutted. Champions will stand and fight to the bitter end. Y2K trying to... I, I hope he's not trying to wheel his catapult fully away, because that just extends the game beyond what is necessary. The Harad General falls. And the Pharisim Swordmasters are going to push down the hill. They can fill their pockets in terms of kills if they want by charging through this fodder. <coughs> Yeah, there's no need for this from Y2K. The, the match is over. At least face the right way when you die. 
champions of Nakarat still fighting hard. They're, they, they're engaging in the spirit of things. Look at all this running that's happening. There we go, that's a little bit better. Charging the catapult crew in. Seeing the writing on the wall. And that is going to be that. These orcs are going to get absolutely slaughtered on the way forward. Three champions of Nafarat remain. Further down. Is the catapult crew gone? Yeah, it must have done. So yeah, I mean, to be fair to Harad, it's looking like they are the, the last ones standing with their champions of Nafarat here as they slowly get worn down by the Numenorean steel bows. And yeah, they did come back from Rousing, so the, uh, the, de the um, Demons of the Desert did awaken, reawaken the Belagaya pikemen. And that is going to be that. This is the last one left standing for the attackers. Very close, though, within a single percentage point. Or was that the last one left standing? I guess not. There must be someone down at the bottom of this hill. Well, there we go. Let it be a salve upon our wounds. An impressive fight to be sure as we have a look around here. As Minas Tirith often is, a bit of a slaughterhouse. So yeah, a very good siege I have to say. And I think the defenders did pretty well. I mean, the, the numbers are not as kind to Dol Amroth, but they were also the ones that were left behind. Um, and obviously the killing field that was that hill at the end, they weren't able to take part in as much as their two allies. Also... You know, on the front line where a lot of the killing was happening, that was primarily Gondor and Numenor as well. As for the attackers, mixed performance. So, uh, Ranchby dressing, obviously, I think, is, is a newer player, which would indicate why he was only using one siege tower. They could have dealt with Dol Amroth maybe a little bit more efficiently if he'd spread his wings a bit more. Um, as for everyone else, names that I've seen before, reasonably good siege, I would think. I think, in the end, composition may very well have been in question here. I think that T-Bag is really high quality army. We never really saw him lay down the punishment. Like he's got the most kills of all of the attackers. But again, like it, we never really saw like the Temple Guard for example. They got uh, they got panned in. The trolls I think were all committed a little bit too early. They did some damage, but they were all shut down. I think, you know, the Witchers, they were very well monitored. They got one shot off, I think, which was fairly devastating to the veterans of Osgiliath, but ultimately not enough to pay for themselves and ultimately diffused very, very simply. Yeah, I think the defenders were worthy victors today, All on, in all honesty. Harad tried to make something happen at the end with the demons. Credit to them for that, but ultimately it wasn't to be. Let's see what did the damage for Kartunka, who was uh, second only to Gondor in terms of kills. Pharazim Swordmasters, really the, you know, the... The finisher, really. They were the ones that they weren't going to be able to overcome the Pharism Swordmasters, the attackers in melee, and they weren't able to get their demons or their catapult into a good position to do that job for them. Numenorean cohort, fairly variable performances, but all of them at least got over 100. One of the Belagai Pikes got overwhelmed, the other one held the line alongside their Numenorean shield guard relatively well. But the front gate, initially it went quite well, then it got pretty messy, which is not the ideal fight for Pikes. And the Numenorean shield guard, obviously AP, useful. Naran Ari Sentinel is really holding it down in the late game, but the Royal Legion of Armenolos, 411 kills, very impressive. But it really was sort of a one after the other type of situation with them, and none of the units sent after them were particularly strong. Like Muhad Berserkers, Moranon Infantry, all the sort of thing that a unit as strong as the Royal Legion is going to be very comfortable with dealing with. So yeah. Further down, again, some units breaking 200. Two units of Adunaim Shadow Bows is, you know, if you're going to double dip on a unit of archers, double dipping on rangers is very understandable in a situation like this, and both of them did okay. You know, for rangers, you know, getting, you know, just shy of 300 kills is a fairly average performance, to be honest with you, in a siege like this, when we've seen them get 400, 500, up to 1,000 um, in the past. But obviously, the attackers, I think, did a pretty good job at spreading their wings enough to the point where there wasn't a really blobbed up area where they could shoot into. Um, and that, I think, was different. Numenor and steel bows as well, getting fa fairly variable results too. Um, but ultimately, a good performance from the defenders here and a well-deserved W, I think. Um, so a big thank you to Katunka the Easterling for sending this one in and a big thank you to all of the players for being a part of this Minas Tirith battle. Nice to see the old girl back. Um, as far as what comes next goes, I'm not really sure. I think this one will probably be posted after the intended stream I do with Jay Monster on Friday and the stream that I want to do on Saturday. Um, so I think this will be sort of after that and it will also definitely be after the most recent channel update video um, like i said in that channel update video i think it's um 
the information in that is subject to change, but it is the most likely course of events as it happens. Um, so no need to really go into that um, anymore at the end of these videos like that. As far as what happens going forward, not really sure, to be honest with you. I do have a few battles I can get on with. From a Reforged perspective, obviously want to be uh, doing some streams here and there. Like I said, I think a good guide to that is probably going to be one video every uh, every 10 days. I think is probably going to be the, the best way to look at that one stream every 10 days, rather. Because I think I can do that without compromising my actual schedule all that much. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll play it by ear. It really depends on how well they're received, to be honest with you, how much it impacts my schedule. If people want more of them, then obviously I can replace some videos with potentially a fairly hefty streaming day. But um, it, it really does depend on how well it's done. Like for, for now, the intention is to still primarily focus on just the videos, because I think that's kind of, it's kind of better for this format, especially with Total War. Like I think Total War streaming outside of campaigns it's kind of difficult to get the nice camera angles and the nice cinematics that you want when you're playing in multiplayer because you kind of have to look down from on high and look at your armies uh, moving forwards but like i said it's all subject to change really i'm, I'm definitely someone who doesn't sit, have a really rigid schedule i really try and roll with the punches a little bit more try and be a little bit more adaptable and i think that's going to be important in the weeks and months to come considering the general uncertainty behind everything at the moment eh? but yeah hope you enjoyed this and I hope you will join me for whatever is next.